Tom Lam, and my name is David Kendall, and I am the director of the program. Ce soir, nous sommes très pri privilégiés d'avoir avec nous un visiteur très spécial. Uh, we are very, very uh, privileged this evening to have a special visitor with us, uh, Monsieur Victor Zelensov. Uh, il est un grand expert du programme spatial russe, uh, uh, specializes and uh, uh, specialist in the Russian space program. And uh, as, uh, as noted on the screen, uh, Victor will give us a uh, evening uh, presentation, a uh, distinguished lecture on the current and future Russian space programs. Just a little bit of background on Victor. He is a, an associate professor, as noted on the screen, of the Bauman Moscow State Technical University. Um, uh, and Victor specializes at the university in space robotics and general aerospace education. So. Could you please join me in a big welcome to Victor Spencer. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure of mine to be here and to present the uh, concepts of current and future Russian space programs. Uh, I had a chance to get involved in the International Space, Station, uh, Space University program today, participate in some departmental activities, talk to the students, talk to the uh, teachers, and uh, I find this program very useful. Uh, so, speaking of the Russian space program, I would like to start with a little quiz. I would like to ask you a question. What do you see on this screen? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm putting it down because uh, everything uh, we are dealing with today within the framework of this program actually started with this uh, sphere about this big, which was here with the transmitter, a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor, and which actually opened us the way into the exciting world of space exploration. And uh, let me continue with my questions to you. Do you recognize this elderly gentleman? No. Wonderful. So, well, as a future space leaders, we will be in something. So, what, what, what is he famous with? So the next one will be kind of easy. And uh, yeah, that's right. So recently we celebrated the 50th anniversary of this historical mission. Um, normally the uh, widespread opinion is that it's just, just one orbit around the Earth. It's fairly simple, but it appears that it's not. In fact, uh, that flight had 13 autonomous conditions, uh, only due to the efforts of the engineers who designed that vehicle, everything ended up the way it ended up. And uh, my next question would be, <coughs> who is this gentleman? Uh, but it's it's a rare photograph of Florio in about your age, when he was just starting getting involved with rocketry and its use, and he probably didn't think about the space exploration at that point. But so basically, uh, those three people are probably the most well-known uh, representative of. Uh, the world of Russian space. Um, so well, she's well known as well. But that would be easy because she, she's only one. So uh, once you are so well informed, let me progress to the subject of my presentation. 
So like everything which is going in this world, uh, the space activities uh, are regulated by a certain guidelines and principles and uh, laws. So we have the same kind of situation in Russia. So uh, the space activity of my country is regulated by the uh, space activity law, which was adopted in 1993. And this document uh, basically is introducing uh, uh, what space activity is, what country is doing uh, to carry out this kind of activity. Uh, it gives the uh, definition of uh, various terms of well, who the cosmonauts are, how they are selected, uh, who executes the space policy of Russian Federation, and, and all that sort of thing. So that's the uh, major guideline regulating our space activity. Um, according to this law, um, the president of Russian Federation is overseeing the space activity of the country. He is uh, reviewing all the decisions and approving them if it is necessary. Uh, and the government implements the presidential decisions in the uh, uh, space activity through the uh, executive organization we are going to talk about later. Uh, there are two more documents uh, which are covering the, uh, the uh, current phase of the space activities of Russia. The first one is called the State Program, uh, Russian Space Activity 2012-2020. seven-year period. Those activities are covered in those documents, and those documents are basically the short-term plans of the space agency is working to. And uh, once this uh, plan is um, pulled together, the agency is actually pulling together their plan on the internet program. Uh, another important document is called uh, Principles of uh, Russian Federation Space Policy for the space, a state policy for the space activity for a certain period. And it augments the state program. So these are the legal grounds Russian space activity relies upon. And uh, the documents, in particular, the space program, the federal, uh, the federal space program, uh, outline three priorities uh, of the Russian space activity. So the first one is guaranteed ex access to space. That means that we've got to have the means available to put our uh, payloads in orbit. Uh, and we've got to be independent with doing those things. Uh, we need to develop the space technology, which would uh, be used for in the interests of national economy. Uh, we've got to develop our space industry and what is more important speaking here is compliance with international obligations. So keeping our word before the other countries is always a top priority in space. So uh, the second priority is to develop various means uh, which will be launched in space and used in space to uh, do the science, some new information, some new results scientists can rely upon. And the third priority, uh, which might be strange, is carrying out the human spaceflight program. So we can actually ask the question, why is the human spaceflight so lowly priority? Uh, the matter is that uh, Russia has always been taking one of the leading positions in that period. And this is a situation still in, in place. So uh, we've got a lot uh, to rely upon. So we don't need uh, as much.
much for developing to that field uh, as, say, in the second one. Because uh, developing the scientific satellites, space based uh, observatories is uh, way more critical in terms of space science and technology. And well, we should have moved that. Uh, we still need to catch up with that field. Um, the, federal, uh, the, the space policy of Russian Federation is, impl is implemented by our national space agency. So the space agency is called Roscosmos. It was established in 1992. You can see the headquarters here. It's in the central part of Moscow. And uh, it implements the space policy. It also develops the documents which are later on approved by the government and president which regulate the space activities. Uh, and it controls everything which belongs to the country and it is related to uh, the space program. We are talking about uh, the state-owned uh, assets only right now, because currently we do have some emerging, emerging private initiative uh, in the field of space technology as well. And uh, you can see the yearly budget, <coughs> about 166 billion rubles, equal to 5 billion Canadian, Canadian dollars. Um, this, it's not much and it's not little. So it's bigger than some companies have, and that's definitely less than. Uh, NASA has put it down. Um, and here is, here is the news, what we are talking about the future. Uh, the way the agency works uh, is a little bit different from the way uh, ESA or NASA, for example, work. Uh, the agency is like a governmental office which is uh, overseeing everything, which is uh, doing all the bureaucratic activities, if we can put it this way. Uh, but it does not carry out research, it does not build the spacecraft on its own. Uh, however, it controls a number of state-owned uh, companies, corporations, and enterprises. Uh, to implement, uh, uh, to implement its goals. So, uh, till recently, all those companies were reporting directly to Roscosmos, uh, but the brand started being observed, um, uh, which was saying that the management of all those companies is not really efficient. So in order to resolve all, uh, resolve that program, the decision was made to establish a new entity, which is called United Rocket and Space Corporation. And that decision relies on the same uh, policy in the other fields of activities, such as, for example, um, aircraft industry. So we've got the uh, uh, <coughs> aircraft building. Uh, United uh, Aircraft Building Corporation, same thing in shipbuilding. So we're going to have the space one as well, and uh, it is going to be uh, a primary contractor to Roscosmos in terms of uh, developing and manufacturing uh, space vehicles, equipment, and whatever is needed to uh, implement Russian space program. So the transition is in progress right now. Uh, the corporation will include 10 integrated structures, um, which are already existing corporations, uh, consisting of 48 enterprises in total. And it will also include 14 independent organizations uh, dealing with uh, space technology and to give the example of what's going to become a part of URSC uh, Rocket and Space 
Corporation, which is dealing with human space flight uh, in Russia, is going to be a part of that. Kalinchi Space Center, which is building launch vehicles, uh, the other um, companies will, will be a part of that as well. So uh, the corporation uh, will be, it will have the stock completely in favor of property, it will be a property of uh, the government. And uh, this transition is going on right now and it will be complete uh, by the end of 2015. To characterize uh, our space activity, I can give a number of figures here. So by the end of uh, last year, we had 116 spacecraft in orbit. Um, 31 orbital launch uh, took place in 2013 and was successful. There was one failure uh, with Proton launch vehicle. And uh, 38 launches are planned for this year. 13 already took place and there was again one more Proton failure. Um, let me start talking about all those fields which are prioritized and uh, let us uh, talk in details about them. So, uh, Russia always had some good positions in developing and uh, manufacturing and using logic vehicles. So, the vehicle you can see in this chart is um, one of two launch vehicles which can take humans to space now. And which one is the second? Hmm? Chenji. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> Soyuz uh, is a <coughs> successor of the very first rocket which took Sputnik to the orbit. And uh, essentially, um, the design which was made by Korolev and his engineers in 1955 1956, that R7, which was originally conceived as the first intercontinental ballistic missile, had a very interesting and uh, productive life. Uh, targeting completely a different goal. So instead of delivering the warheads uh, across the ocean, it was delivering uh, payloads to the orbit. Um, it is kind of interesting because uh, the American counterpart of R7 is also living the same kind of life. The first American ICBM called Atlas still exists. Uh, I don't know how much is left of the first uh, American ICBM of that design, but still we've got, uh, we've got Atlas launch family and it is uh, used. So, uh, Soyuz FG is a very, very deeply upgraded um, uh, version of uh, uh, R7. So it's got three stages, those uh, three stereophones make up the first stage and the four makes the second stage. Um, it still carries some uh, legacy from R7, so both the first and second stage uh, ignite on the launch pad. Um, the third stage, called Block E, and Soyuz FG was specifically designed to uh, insert into the orbit Soyuz TMA spacecraft. So the reason why it's called FG is that its engine has been upgraded. Uh, it's got a different, more efficient design of the combustion chamber, uh, which provides for the uh, better mixture of uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen and more efficient burning, which uh, gives some advantage in terms of specific impulse and rest. 
Um, so and the most recent launch of Sony ZMG took place um, on 29th of, um, of May, putting a number of crew into the orbit. Uh, to the ISS, um, so <coughs> it is kept being used, um, and it is showing very good reliability. However, it's not uh, the only way uh, that technology develops because uh, we've got a series of vehicles called Soyuz 2. And Soyuz 2 is another very deep upgrade <coughs> to uh, Soyuz Launch Vehicle. Uh, what has been done, uh, yeah, we discussed it in the uh, Aerospace Engineering Department uh, today. Um, the flight control system was upgraded to one based on the flight control computer. Uh, the vehicle acquired uh, the gyro platform as the major sensor of the control system. Uh, and uh, simply it's got lighter for that sake, uh, for that sake so uh, it uh, could develop and deliver more uh, payload to the orbit. Uh, and that version was called Soyuz 2.1A. Uh, Soyuz 2.1B is a deeper upgrade because the first stage engine got replaced to a uh, more powerful, powerful one, uh, RD0124, uh, and that uh, brought the payload to the low Earth orbit to 800 and, uh, 8,200 kilograms. Um, and here you can see Soyuz <coughs> 2, the one B, with uh, we got upper stage and the large payload carrier. Here is another very interesting design which is being tested now. And the matter is that in uh, early 2000s, um, the Russian Department of Defense uh, faced uh, a deficiency of the uh, small meeting capability of uh, vehicles like Cyclone uh, and uh, Cosmos uh, kept being decommissioned. Uh, Algara, the uh, small meeting capability version of Algara, was still under development. Actually, the de development just started at that point. So, some kind of decision was uh, needed in order to provide the launches of the satellites uh, of about two tons into the low Earth orbit. The number of decisions was uh, found. Uh, the first one is using the decommissioned ICBMs. Uh, I'm not going to go into details on them, but we've got uh, three launch vehicles based uh, on the decommissioned ICBMs called uh, Rocket uh, and Strela, which are uh, essentially SS-19 equipped with the uh, ascent unit uh, with the payload. Um, and uh, another <coughs> vehicle is called Dnieper, which is SS-18. Um, any uh, satellite is stolen instead of the warheads. Uh, but uh, well, using those vehicles pose certain difficulties, operational difficulties. Uh, that's why the company which uh, develops Soyuz uh, launch vehicle family called uh, CSKB Progress came out with a very interesting idea. Why don't we use the existing infrastructure, just like existing launchers, uh, and uh, why don't we build the uh, vehicle with the required launching capability based on the existing design of Soyuz? So in order to do that, uh, Soyuz was deprived of the first stage. So you can 
see the modified core. Uh, the uh, engine was replaced to another one um, called MK33. And MK33 is the, is the engine designed for the Soviet equivalent of 75 called M1, which uh, was uh, designed to deliver uh, Soviet cosmonauts to the moon. But due to a number of problems, both technical problems and political problems, those missions didn't take place. But so the uh, um, program was classified, no one knew about it for a very long time. Uh, it just emerged into the public view in uh, the late 1980s. And it appeared that despite of most of the hardware of that program was destroyed, a pretty large batch of MK33s survived, was inspected by uh, American experts from uh, rocket die, I guess. Uh, the certain proportion of that batch went to the US and it is used on Antares launch vehicle now uh, with some upgrades uh, in heavy lakes. Uh, and the remaining ones stayed in Russia and uh, they are used on Soviet 2.1 uh, B. So when the run out of those engines, we use the different ones. Uh, Developed by Yerby Mash for um, a very large people, RD191. And uh, so far, only one launch was made, it was a success. Uh, the rocket has put the demonstrator payload uh, into the desired orbit. And you can see that we can use the same launcher, absolutely the same launcher you use for the other versions of Soyuz to launch this. Um, another very uh, famous manufacturer or design developer manufacturer of launch vehicles uh, in Russia is Kulich Space Center. Um, it participates uh, in a number of international projects such as international launch services and the uh, most recent uh, operational uh, <coughs> launch vehicle, um, which is uh, which has the heaviest lifting capability among Russian space vehicles, uh, launch vehicles now is called Proton M. Um, and you can see its uh, uh, capabilities and dimensions uh, here. Uh, it is operated from Mike Moore. Uh, there are four uh, beds for Proton. Unfortunately, uh, we started observing some quality problems with uh, assembly and manufacturing, but uh, looks like it's going to be taken care of. Proton uh, M has been operational since 2001 and so far made 72 launches. Uh, what, to your mind, is the greatest problem with this project? Again? Ridiculously big. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, this is this is highly toxic. If something happens, well, even, even if everything goes okay, the stage is full and they end up on the ground, especially the first stage and the second stage. So uh, Although those two substances tend to ignite when they are mixed, some residues stay on the ground and that creates a lot of problems for the environment. So, um, so, uh, so, proton will keep being used for some time until another heavy lifting capability matures and then it's going to be phased out. And this is expected by the uh, year 2030. Uh, what is going to replace the rocket? This is the rocket which is called Angara. And Angara has got an interesting concept 
uh, behind it. It is essentially a construction kit uh, consisting of the unified rocket models for the first, second stage, and uh, the upper stages available. So you can use the combination of one, three, or five first stage models. Uh, you can use the second stage, uh, the uh, URM2 as the second or third stage uh, of the launch vehicle, and that gives you the family of uh, the vehicles with the launch capability varying from 2 tons to the low orbit to 24.5 tons in the heaviest uh, version. Actually, uh, another one with seven URMs on the first stage is being designed, but this is slightly different because <coughs> it introduces another uh, four stage, which is bigger, which has got the diameter of about seven meters. Uh, so there is such a thing as Angara 7 as well, but it's not on this slide. <coughs> um, the program ended up being developed for about 20 years and paid about 500 million rupees. So finally, we got to uh, the flight testing phase. So it didn't go, I mean, the program did not go exactly the designers uh, saw it from the very beginning. For example, uh, out of that set, only this one was <coughs> uh, implemented and uh, the five URM one and there are five that have been implemented as well. So the government said that we don't need this one and we don't need this one. So essentially, Angara 1.2 and Angara 5 will be built and tested. So 1.2 has been built and it's in Lysetsk uh, spaceport right now. Uh, it was rolled out to the pad. <coughs> Uh, however, during the flight preparation, some issues were revealed, so the uh, pre-launch pre uh, pre countdown was terminated automatically, and the uh, Provincial Space Center being the major developer uh, is analyzing the results. <coughs> so the, uh, so Vera 5 is also uh, being built. So there are some pictures of the uh, URMs being assembled in the Provincial uh, Assembly Facility. Uh, they made public. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can go to www.provincial.ru and uh, you will see some, some pictures of that process. Um, you can see that uh, the new band was built for this uh, vehicle is going to use this uh, universal versatile uh, services structure, uh, which is good for uh, both uh, 1.2 and 5 uh, versions of Angara. And the launch site is in Pusets. And we will talk about the uh, launch sites in the uh, Another interesting idea, which uh, is covered by the uh, uh, principles of Russian space uh, activity development, uh, Russian space policy, is developing the reusable first stage. Launch vehicle vehicle with reusable first stage. I know that various developers address this uh, problem differently. So SpaceX is uh, trying to use the active uh, braking by means of the main propulsion system and so on shock absorber uh, struts um, for the landing gear. Rulichi came out with the other concept, maybe not that efficient uh, mass-wise, but more substantial, I would put it this way. So what they suggested, uh, they suggested using the tilt wing, so when the uh, uh, 
rocket launches, the beam is uh, 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 turned along the uh, body of the stage, uh, installing the uh, uh, jet engine in the nose, uh, fitting the stage with uh, the stabilizer, uh, vertical horizontal stabilizers at, at landing gear. And uh, it is called Baikal. So, so far, only this mock-up exists, as well as uh, the concept uh, has been um, just tested by means of analysis. So it looks like it's, it's doable. So it is believed to be uh, uh, a reusable version of a very first state. Um, but it is kind of suspended right now, although the uh, uh, principles of the space policy cover the development of this kind of vehicle in around late 2020s. And uh, speaking of the access to space, uh, we should definitely talk about the launch site. So, uh, currently, Russia has got two major launch sites. Uh, one, of it, about one of them is a road, it's in Kazakhstan, and it's called Baikonur. Uh, we are leasing it from, from, from Kazakhstan for $115 million a year. Uh, and that lease runs through 2050. Um, however, It's not, it's not really comfortable these days, and maybe from, if, if you go serious from the standpoint of the national security, uh, it's not really good having a major launch site situated there. <coughs> so uh, another launch site is being built, and you will see it in some time. Uh, so Baikonur takes a huge area. It is 100 by 70 kilometers, so we are talking about this, this, this part of uh, the town where everyone lives and which supports the activity of the Cosmodrome. Cosmodrome is the term, Russian term, to, which is equal to spaceport. So we call our launch site complex as Cosmodromes. Um, and uh, this is where everything started in 1958. Uh, Five. Uh, right here, right here, you can see the very first launch pad for Soyuz. It is called the Garden Site now. And this is where all the crews to ISS are flying from right now. It's considered to be lucky, although we get another operational plan which will work with uh, Soyuz, it's called plan number 31. And uh, <coughs> recently, I would say recently, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a launch of the ISS, of the group to ISS from that side, uh, just to make sure that we are still capable of launching from there. Because the operations concept is slightly different, it's definitely further away from uh, the crew quarters uh, in, ta in the town of Baikonur is pretty far from the uh, assembly and testing facility where the crew suits up. Uh, just to compare, uh, going from the town to um, the garden space is 45 minutes. Here it's an hour and a half. So it creates some differences, um, but all the problems um, <coughs> and the crew of Oleg Nowitzki, uh, Evgeny Karelkin and Kevin Ford of NASA were launched for that very much. Well, the launch was beautiful. <laughs> uh, besides of the Soyuz pads, uh, Baikonur has got um, four proton pads. Uh, only two of them are operational now. Um, they've got the legacy of uh, the program called Energia Buran, that was the Soviet program to develop 
the reduce, national reusable capability. Can be considered a success, but uh, was never used in practice. So the rocket was built. Uh, in the early age, people with the launch capability of 100 tons was built and uh, it was launched twice. Uh, worked close to perfectly, and <laughs> put it this way. Uh, and uh, the reusable orbiter called Buran was also developed and it included a test mission, uh, a short test mission, which ended up landing on the railway. And this runway in black milk. So the runway is still functional. So this is where the cargo planes uh, land when the conversion payloads come from uh, uh, abroad. Um, and the crew engine is involved in commercial launch services uh, with Proton. Uh, Progress, uh, which is uh, developing and manufacturing Soyuz. Uh, also is, but currently all those launches are done from Kuru. <coughs> uh, besides of that, uh, Baikonur has got a uh, launch site for uh, the launch vehicle called Zenit. And Zenit can be considered a Soviet legacy. So it's uh, a launch vehicle with a lifting capability of about 14 tons. Uh, its design is based on the design of the first stage of energy launch vehicle. Uh, we can't consider it a national launch vehicle, although very large proportion of its components are made in Russia because it's assembled and the, uh, the structure is built in near the drops of Ukraine. And uh, despite of all the problems. Uh, the existing uh, contract for uh, Z, which is also used uh, for sea launch, uh, are still in place and uh, sea launch uh, did receive the rocket from Washington. So uh, for this year, we've got two launches scheduled involving uh, Z, and Ross Cosmos is claiming that. We are still go for that, so we will we'll just wait and see what happens. Um, besides of that, Baikonur has got an extensive uh, measuring and communication communication facilities to land to, to land to sites which track the rocket on the sand. Uh, it's got the assembly facilities, integration facilities, fueling stations, uh, so on. Um, that's the only Russian launch uh, site which supports the human missions uh, to the orbit and in particular to ISS. Uh, here are some pictures by the room. So this is uh, the Barents pad, a very special rocket devoted to the Olympics of 2014. It is carrying those Olympic benchmarks on all the stages and on the payload carry. And uh, this is taken in December uh, when the crew carried the Olympic torch to the station. Actually, operationally, it was quite a difficult mission because uh, for the sake of delivering the torch, uh, even the crew rotation pattern was to be changed because uh, currently uh, ISS is sticking to so-called indirect crew rotation plan. So what it means, uh, the station's got six-person crew. Uh, the duration of the uh, expedition so is uh, constrained with two factors. There are some medical factors which basically called for a year long mission. And coincidentally, uh, half a year, six months, is fairly comfortable for Soyuz, uh, which lifetime in orbit is slightly longer, but it's always good to have a market. So 
the maximum duration of the expedition of three on board the ISS is half a year, and this is the case now. So uh, the station crew uh, of each uh, the expedition crew consists of six people on board, and every expedition has got two numbers. Uh, for the reason that Soyuz fits just on the only three people. So then Soyuz vehicle approaches six months attached to the station, three crew members get to finish their mission and return to the Earth. And then for a period of about three weeks, the remaining three are moving on board the station. The change of command takes place. <coughs> And uh, over those three weeks, or sometimes even shorter, like two weeks, uh, the new uh, component of the station crew, of three crew members, is uh, going for the final load preparations in Baikonur and being launched. So this is what the indirect crew rotation involves. So for the case of the Olympic torch, we had to keep all six on board. Uh, Launch and dock another Soyuz with three more crew members, bringing up the number of people on board the ISS to nine. Uh, do everything which was intended to do with the torch, including taking it outside during the EVA, and then double mess it with the uh, returning crew of three, leaving six people on board the station. Uh, but it, it was done, and the torch was actually used to light the plate of the Olympics. Uh, I'm just, just giving some characteristic features here. So this is the rollout of Soyuz launch vehicle out of uh, building 112, where it is assembled two days prior to the launch. Uh, proton on its pad. And of course, when the Baikonur, but actually makes Baikonur so special is that people are flying into space for Baikonur, and this is the crew. And yes, this gentleman looks familiar. It's the crew of Roman Ramenka, Chris Catlin, and Thomas Marker. And uh, this is actually unique because the temperature outside was about minus 25 Celsius. <coughs> so what you see here are the special thermal coveralls for which are put on top of the uh, pressure suits to pr protect the crew while they're traveling to the bus and to the rocket. <coughs> the second operation launch site of Russia is, I would say, very special because Unlike Baikonur, it's military upgrade. So Baikonur uh, has been, so to say, civilized several years ago. There is no military component. Uh, besides of maybe the quality control officers. When some quality problems started being observed, uh, Roscosmos reintroduced the military assurance. <coughs> in the customer room and in the uh, production facilities to uh, deal with those problems. So uh, a certain little number of military officers are, are present in Baikonur, but it's, it's operated by a, complete, a completely civilian force. Lusetsk is operated by uh, the component of uh, Russian armed, for armed forces, which is called Air and space defense uh, forces. Um, and uh, this launch site, unlike Baikonur, is in the north. It's uh, close to Arkhangelsk on the White Sea coast. And you can see Pusat here, St. Petersburg, Helsinki, and Arkhangelsk, and here is Moscow. Uh, basically, a day and a night on the train from Moscow. And uh, it's got a lot of stuff. Some, some of that is unrelated to the space program because it's a military test range and it is used to, 
test ICBMs. Uh, it's got a reoperational soils bed. Actually, the initial purpose of uh, ESET was to be the launch base of the original R7 ICBM. Uh, but it was very quickly understood that the vehicle, which takes two days to prepare it for lunch, is not really efficient as an ICBM. But at that point, it served the purpose, its purpose. Uh, actually, we just break from the subject for a moment. There is a very strong uh, uh, reason opinion that the design was made by Oregon with launching the first satellite and the first human space and land. And uh, the story was uh, there was a specification for the rocket. And the requirements for the warhead mass were developed by another famous uh, Soviet scientist uh, later, uh, who later struggled for the human rights, uh, case mission uh, Sakharov. Andrei Sakharov. So there is no written confirmation, but it is believed that one night Korolev had a meeting with Sakharov, and they talked for about two hours. And after that, the uh, requirement for the payload of mass was signed. So that was the warhead of 5.5 tons. So the uh, <coughs> engineers dealing with the warheads looked at that and said, well, that was too much. And uh, the, uh, some of the court, some of the those people in the said, well, why, why are they requiring this? So, so much of the payload. The court of just looked at them and said, it would be easier to launch the men's case. <laughs> so, besides of Soyuz, the set has got uh, plans for uh, Cosmos launch vehicle, which is not used now. It's got the launch facility for rocket. Rocket is very interesting in terms of the way it is being launched. It's, it's an ICBM as it is, liquid propellant, uh, liquid, uh, using the liquid propellant. So it is basically made and put into the container, and it is in the silo, sealed in that container, so when the lifetime expires, it's being pulled out. Uh, uh, the top of the container is being removed, the work has been placed with the assembly, and uh, the whole thing is, stuck, is installed on the launch pad. And uh, this is probably the only uh, uh, Russian launch vehicle with the vertical payload integration, because uh, the way the uh, assembly is installed, it, it is done on the bed from the servicing tower to the container. Right here in the middle, the bed for Ungara has been built. And it's, well, I know I don't, didn't follow the news for the last couple of days, but maybe the rocket is still on the path. And uh, you can see that the setting is completely different. Once Baikonur is in the desert, here it's just like very beautiful forest. Uh, this is the, the pole, and this is how it looks in winter. Uh, I should be worth mentioning that uh, we never had any problems with delayed launches for the weather reasons, because uh, all Russian um, launch vehicles are developed to the spec which prescribes the being operational for minus 40 Celsius to plus 50. <laughs> and this is a new and big thing for Russia. So when, after Sochi Olympics, it was declared that this is the priority number one. Uh, this is the new launch site being built at the far east. You can see the spot here, nearby Vladivostok, in the Murski region. 
The reasons why we need this are various. Uh, first, aiming the transport role of the Far East would boost the development of that region. It's a, it's a very good geopolitical factor because having the large size there would probably require some servicing infrastructure. It will require only you solve the problem the proper way. It will require educational facility, it will require some production plants. Uh, because it's more logical to build something and launch, launch it from the same area rather than transporting it from the central Russia. Uh, I was trying to find a decent plan of, uh, of Vostochny, but it looks like it's, it's gone through a number of changes. And uh, so I decided to stick to uh, the satellite imagery and that depicts the current status. So you see this road up there, which is coming to this spot. And then right here, there is some area being um, cleared and construction going there, and another one. So this is another picture. So this area has got a launch pad for Soyuz 2. Uh, and we will see the status uh, in half a minute. Uh, and this is the technical area where the uh, integration facilities, uh, union facilities are going to be. A lot of priority is, go is given to this uh, project now. Then uh, you can see that it is progressing. So we can see the bed. Essentially, you can see the bed itself will be cast out of concrete. You can see the plane range, and all those trailers are the uh, construction infrastructure. So this that is, that is the status of the Stoshni right now. Uh, besides of the soil spent, uh, there is a plan to build the launcher complex for Agar there. And uh, a launcher complex for the launch vehicle we don't know about yet, but this is going to be a booster for the new generation fuel transportation vehicle. So besides, uh, so so we, we we basically covered the, space, the access to space now, and uh, we can talk about uh, the applications, uh, because it's uh, also a priority uh, of the space program. So this is the project which was going on for quite a while. And uh, it, the system is functioning right now. This is Russian national uh, positioning and timing system called GLONX, which is like a global navigation system. Uh, is slightly uh, <coughs> on the same principle that uh, GPS uh, and other uh, positioning systems, but uh, it's got three orbital planes and you've got eight satellites in each orbital plane, which, cover, uh, which is supposed to, uh, which is covering uh, the whole world. Uh, this is the design of the system. We currently got. 30 GLONASS satellites in orbit, so one of them is a testing, uh, testing vehicle for uh, this GLONASS K. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got 29 uh, GLONASS M vehicles. Uh, actually, the mass is wrong. It should be 1600 kilograms. So those are heavy, they need return to be launched on, and those can go up on Soyuz 2 with Krigata first day. So we've got some spares in orbit, and uh, the major activity right now is, is going on the ground, because uh, the system functions 
but a uh, major task now is to bring it to the end user, to build the end user's equipment, and uh, some steps uh, in that direction are kind of peculiar. For example, uh, since a certain time, there is the custom regulation which entitles <coughs> some ladies on the uh, electronic devices which has got uh, which are compatible with GPS but which are not compatible with GLONET for being imported in Russia. And uh, we do have some sensor, uh, some, uh, the new uh, iPhones, I guess, and uh, new Samsung, Samsung phones uh, do support GLONET. Uh, we do take care of some uh, scientific projects. Uh, I'm not much of a scientist, I'm an engineer, so I'll just tell you briefly what we've got. So there is a number of spacecraft which are uh, studying sun earth connections, and then uh, the projects include the inter helium sound, uh, resonance, and Terion F2. Um, uh, the astrophysical satellites from here, well, it, it is more correct to call them the uh, orbital observatories. So, Spectre R is already in orbit. It's a, radio it's a space borne radio telescope. And uh, then uh, we are talking about uh, the similar. Uh, Orbital facilities that are operating in the different bands of spectrum. Um, Spectra RG is being built, Spectra M, Spectra UF uh, uh, are also going to be built and launched. Uh, there are projects called Nuclon and Gamma 400, uh, which are also for the astrophysical <coughs> research. And there is a pretty large uh, project called Ast Astrometry. Um, if my memory doesn't fail me, it's a space-based interferometer, a very large base, and using uh, the equilibrium points, or branch points. So this is all being designed. Uh, I'm not mentioning uh, all the kinds of communication <coughs> projects, project, such as communication satellites uh, and uh, remote sensing satellites. Uh, we've got uh, them going as well, so I just want to progress to the subject which is more interesting, which is the lunar exploration. We want to be back to the moon, but it's still too far to from bringing humans there, but we want to resume the what is called on this continent the robotic exploration of the moon. So we've got a series of missions planned. So the first one is going to be the first mission launched from Slobodny in 2016. <coughs> it's going to be called Luna 25, but the name of that mission is Luna Globe. So Luna Globe. Um, is uh, a project to develop, basically to learn how to land on the moon using the uh, up-to-date technology and demonstrate that it is safe, it, it is working, and uh, the uh, challenge is that we've got to land uh, not on the equatorial area of the moon, but somewhere close to the south. Because uh, the whole interest uh, about that <coughs> is the presence of water. So the big goal behind all that series of missions is to deliver the lunar ice sample to the Earth. And that's quite challenging for many reasons. Because well, you get to do this, you get to have the technology to return that sample intact, and you get to take that sample. And normal drilling techniques do not work because the drill heats up and uh, it will damage the sample. So the new technique uh, of cryogenic drilling uh, is being uh, developed to so involve 
of the bullet, the walls of the mutilated arm, and the uh, uh, probes. Uh, the walls of the medium armor to deliver the sample from uh, the lever which obtains the uh, sample to uh, the delivery vehicle, which is uh, return the sample to the Earth. Uh, some orbital uh, communication related facilities are required, and uh, the orbital mission will be launched as well. It will function both as the relay and uh, the uh, lunar mapping spacecraft, which is going to carry out a lot of the other kinds of research as well. So, um, so this is the plan for the moon. There are some plans for Mars and Venus. So moon around is essentially a reflect of Phobos group, a mission to, deli to deliver a sample of uh, the material of Phobos, a natural satellite of Mars to the Earth. Uh, the original mission was tried in 2009 due to the avionics failure. The spacecraft didn't leave the Earth orbit. Uh, so <coughs> lessons were learned. It's going to be uh, rebuilt. Is not the correct word because uh, it will be reworked. Let's say. Uh, Martian projects, including. ExoMars, so uh, we are going to be building the descent module for uh, the mission which is currently joint European and Russian mission to deliver the European rover to, to Mars and now it's going to take two Russian <coughs> rovers. The first mission uh, will be taken is by the demonstration mission, how the technology works, and the second one will deliver the rover. Uh, Expedition M is a uh, mission proposed by Institute of Space Research and uh, Lavochkin Corporation, uh, uh, pardon me, Lavochkin Associ Association manufacturing space probes. This is the Mars solar sample return mission, which is very, very, very far away in terms of time. <coughs> Uh, there is an idea to uh, return to Venus in 2020s as well. Uh, launch the uh, uh, atmospheric probes uh, from the, uh, the balloons into the atmosphere, uh, put the lander on the surface, basically approach the uh, problem which was solved uh, many years ago but with the new technology for Venus. And the project called Laplace involves the mission into the system of Jupiter to one of the satellites of Jupiter. Uh, approaching the probably the most spectacular field of the uh, space flight, or this is the human space flight, uh, because it doesn't matter what robots do in space, it's always great to have humans somewhere <coughs> where we need them. Uh, and here we had a change. Uh, in 2012, we had the first open uh, contest to be selected to the past <coughs> It was the first ever attempt to do it uh, in my country. Prior to that, uh, the selection was closed to the engineers of the space industry, uh, mostly reserved to the rocket and space corporation. They're here because it's a major company in that field, but people from uh, engineers, <laughs> people from the rest also do. Uh, but in 2012, the first national call was made and uh, the open selection was performed. You can see these criteria here. Uh, you can see that being involved in the ISS required the candidates to be <coughs> pardon me, more or less fluent in English. Um, this is 
also the criteria regarding the working experience, which is different. So, well, to make the long story short, uh, eight candidates were selected, and they've just gone for their basic, basic space flight training, and six of them are accredited as the cosmonaut dash test engineer. So, uh, two remaining, uh, one of them, a young gentleman, um, I would put it this way, he was disqualified for the medical reasons, but uh, he's okay physically, he's just got some particularity, uh, physical particularity, which would prevent him from flying. So that it's not publicized what it is. The other one, uh, a young lady, I uh, think she will remain in the core as a candidate, and uh, at one point she will be certified. Uh, so you, you, you all know that Russia is involved in the International Space Station project, and the uh, Russian segment constitutes the large portion of the station, and this, this is actually probably the most beautiful picture of the station ever taken. And it's taken internationally because the idea came from the European astronaut Paolo Gaspoli and it was implemented by uh, NASA, putting the station into the right attitude with the space shuttle dash. Uh, and Roscosmos, uh, with Roscosmos Soyuz commander Dmitry Kondratiev, who was flying Soyuz. While Paolo was taking those pictures and shooting the video. And Casey Coleman um, was supporting a board service as well. So, Russian space, uh, a Russian segment of the ISS consists of two heavy modules uh, FGV Zaya, uh, Zaya, the first component of the ISS launched in November 1998. Uh, another 20 tons module, which is called uh, Zvezda Service Module, which has been the leading quarters and well, whatever else for quite a long time. Um, it's the uh, uh, major habitable module of the Russian segment, which is also carrying uh, the controls uh, and carrying the propulsion system, which makes it possible to uh, control the station propulsion. Pierce uh, docking compartment, which is uh, also used as an airlock. Another small module uh, on top of it called uh, OISC. Uh, it is a second airlock and it's got some scientific improvement. Right here is a module called RASSET. Uh, it's a module with the uh, Scientific payloads for the mini research module uh, one, and that's the only module of the Russian segment launched uh, on space shuttle. Actually, that's probably the only Russian payload launch ever launched on space shuttle. Uh, the plans for the Russian segment are to add another 20 ton module here to the major docking port on uh, Zvezda. And it's called Multi-Purpose Laboratory Module. The, the plan is to launch it uh, in 2015. Then, in 2016, it's going it's to be augmented with the load module, which will provide the docking capability for another two modules called Science and Power Module in 2017 and 2018. And you can see progress vehicle um, and lots of Soyuz vehicles, but I don't think there is a plan to fly that many Soyuz. It's uh, just uh, showing the capability to do it those the vehicles. So uh, this is what the rational segment of the ISS is going to look like. And uh, 
this is what the aerospace engineering department was dealing with today. Uh, so use TMA and spacecraft, uh, which is uh, <coughs> currently the major means of delivering crew members to uh, the International Space Station. Uh, uh, so you can see three major components, the descent module, the assembly and instrumentation compartment, which has got the avionics compartment and the propulsion section and the aviation compartment <coughs> providing some moving loading for the crew model. Um, <coughs> and you can see that three crew members are situated in the capsule, the habitation compartment has got some equipment mounted in it and uh, it is also carrying the cargo which is delivered to the station and you can see uh, the tanks or the propulsion system we talked about today uh, solar arrays, uh, automatic random lunar docking system antennas speaking of random lunar docking, there is another novelty so to say, uh, before that, traveling to the station on Soyuz to two days, two days of that, <coughs> 34 orbits around the Earth. Uh, it gave the ground uh, personnel more flexibility in terms of supporting the docking because essentially the spacecraft inserts, then the orbit is measured, then you can rectify your uh, random solution as for which girls are made at which point, and well, after every girl you can actually uh, re-measure the orbit and just uh, do another iteration, so two days give you enough money in that standpoint. But imagine uh, the habitable volume of 10 cubic meters. So for three crew members, for two days. Uh, usually sleeping was arranged in such a fashion that two crew members slept in the habitation compartment and one in the capsule. Uh, also, in order to maintain the power balance, the spacecraft was put into so-called solar solar-oriented spin, which is like a row pitch you and roll spin, and uh, that created some centrifugal forces which would require you strapping in in the habitation compartment unless you wanted to sleep on the docking edge. <laughs> so, uh, keeping this in mind, and also keeping uh, in mind the upgrades to uh, Soyuz TMA, which made it Soyuz TMA M, and mainly the new flight control computers, the new onboard measurement system, uh, and a lot of experience in random lunar docking operations. Uh, the question was asked to the trajectory planners in Canada and So the trajectory planners came with the uh, approach which enables to go to the station on the fourth orbit or in six hours after the launch. It's got some it's got another advantage because uh, this is yet the period when the uh, uh, symptoms of adopting to zero G environments are not that pronounced. So the crew might be uh, comfortable enough according to many operations that we are required. So, and uh, we've been flying in this fashion since March 2013. One of those four orbit randoms turned into the 34 orbit randoms uh, due to the peculiarity of the flight software, which was too conservative. Assessing the radius, uh, the, the, the vehicle's attitude radius for a certain uh, random mover. Uh, but the last one, uh, the flows in the four orbits and go to the station. So the problem has been addressed. And here you can see Soyuz. 
in the assembly facility prior to the cancer meeting of the vegetarian and spiritual systems in orbit. Uh, this vehicle looks looks like Soyuz, uh, but it is not. It resembles it in shape. So instead of the capsule, it's got the renewing system compartment, which carries the propellant for the station uh, propulsion system. Uh, the equivalent of the fabrication compartment, compartment carries the dry cargo, and besides the propellant, uh, the vehicle carries water and compressed gases to the station. So this is the resupply vehicle called Progress. And Progress performs another very important function of the space station. Uh, station uh, rosters is got the limited time. And service module is, is already been in orbit for quite a long time. It was designed for 15 years. So the uh, flight time of the uh, SM thrusters is conserved. So instead of that, uh, uh, thrusters or progress are used to control the attitude of the station when the propulsive control is required. So for that reason, one progress is always <laughs> brought to the station left on the uh, service model left port. And another one is always dog to uh, one of the major ports, so which actually offsets it from the station's uh, inertia axis, creating a larger arm in terms of the roll control. So progress is also performing the role of the uh, replaceable propulsion system for, for the station. And uh, flight control wise, it isn't the same with the uh, station system. And that's progress in orbit. And this is probably the final point of my presentation today, which is being discussed. Uh, and actually, some components are already, uh, are already built. Uh, this is the new generation crew transportation vehicle. You can see that the concept is very different. Uh, the idea is to build a vehicle uh, which would be partially invisible. So the re-entry vehicle, from the re-entry vehicle for four crew members, uh, will be able to be used for uh, 10 missions. Initially, the plan was kind of ambitious to try the uh, propulsive uh, descent instead of the parachute, but uh, then we came to the conclusion that there is nothing better than old, uh, when the old, uh, well proven solution with the backup capability and very efficient mass wise. Uh, we go to land on those landing gear struts to uh, protect the heat shield. Uh, also, the landing will be, I would say, more gentle compared to Soyuz because uh, Soyuz does have the soft landing thrusters, but it's just like they just off pulse when the vehicle is about one meter over the surface and it's still pretty uh, sensible blow. Uh, here, uh, uh, the system <coughs> will be continuously uh, operating. So the idea is to achieve a fairly comfortable landing mode. Uh, the reason why we've got two messes here, so 14 tons is the mass for the low Earth orbit missions for the ISS, and 20 tons is for the circular missions. So the arrangement of the propulsion compartment uh, is different for uh, the LEO missions and uh, the lunar missions. Uh, so this is the concept. Uh, what we've got now, we've got uh, an engineering mock-up of the uh, re-entry vehicle. Uh, built and this is displayed at MEX uh, 2013 uh, 
here with a space shown near muscle, and uh, it's got the interior, and it is good for some tests for research and recovery forces. Uh, it's still far away for some reason. We need to evacuate the camp. So how do we do that? Because soils, well, soils is very, it's very simple in those terms. It's either on the side or the edge uh, is on top of you. You can get, get out through the edge. <coughs> you agree how over the ground, so you would probably use, uh, have to use the special safety harness, special tethers rolled out of the capsule to get on the ground. And this is the experiment involving some uh, testing engineers uh, clad in a uh, sample pressure suit uh, to verify those concepts. Mm -hmm. Uh, internal design, as you could see on the previous slide, is also very different from Soyuz. Uh, U6, uh, you can see them on the second slide, will be used. So, uh, the requirement for the vehicle has got uh, two professional crew members on board, the commander and flight engineer, and uh, there is a requirement to provide the single crew member control capability. So, Single crew member should be able to control the mission and perform all the operations. So this is a new and unusual approach to the implementation of the control panel, which is swiveled. It is stowed against the wall in orbit, and whenever it's necessary, it's lowered uh, over those two seats. And this is the interior. So the new, new seats uh, of Chigev will be used. Uh, conceptually, I think they are pretty similar to what the other people doing, the advanced crew transportation vehicles are doing. Those food rests will be foldable, can be used as the tables. Um, the personal hygiene compartment will be separated from the main volume of the capsule. Uh, so it's also worth mentioning that it's the first occasion when the professional uh, designer, industrial designer, who was involved in uh, the effort to design the interior of the spacecraft. Because usually there are some engineers familiar with the human factor and some architects. This gentleman was kind of lead uh, on the advanced uh, automobile design program with the European branch of the Europe prior to moving to Russia to take care of this project. So this is our future in terms of human spaceflight. So at this point, I'm open for questions and answers. Uh, I would say late 2017, 
That's why the contract for the Soyuz flights went up through late 2017. But um, the story is that flying uh, will get even more interesting at that point. Because the way the station works, um, every crew has got uh, a crew member trained to the level of specialist, meaning the person capable of operating, maintaining, and repairing systems on both US segment and, uh, and Russian segment. So taking into account that indirect crew rotation procedure, it appears that you can't make uh, the transportation with the crew purely uh, American or purely Russian. So there should be a, uh, an American or partners crew member on one of the Soyuzes or um, PTK, uh, PTK and PTKMPs, and one Russian crew member is on board of those prospective U.S. crew members. So it's quite possible. Uh, hi, I've got used to the standing mic room. Um, just to be aware of bad news, the NGAR launch didn't go ahead on the weekend, sorry about that. Um, but I have a question about Tizkash. Um, they're responsible, I think, for product assurance within the Russian Roscosmos Federation. Um, are they being changed anyway following the recent proton payments? Say it again, I didn't think quite, quite yet. Uh, is the structure of Tizkash going to change? Oh, it's um, new one. Yeah, oh, bad pronunciation. Following the recent failures with the program. Oh, uh, <coughs> we never, uh, we haven't heard anything of any changes in Snemash yet. So far, I would say the director is in his office, and uh, I've never, I haven't heard anything of any changes. But I would put it this way, and just, just to clarify for the others. Snimash is the major research facility for Roscosmos. It's a research institute um, which I would say has seen uh, some hard time during that period of reforms, but it's got some unique testing facilities. It's, uh, it's got some wind tunnels, some shock tunnels and stuff, and the Russian Mission Control Center and the building, the facility, it is also a part of the city bush. So uh, it is critical, so I don't really know uh, how it can be changed or restructured. Um, uh, today we had a very interesting presentation about new space and what's happening in the US on the commercial side. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything happening like that in Russia or if there's plans to promote startups in, in the space sector to, to create a uh, yeah, counterpart to what the space agencies are doing. So um, just I would split it into two sections. Startups are also are, are already kind of promoted. Because we've got uh, the entity which is called uh, Skalkova Business Incubator, which is a governmental program to create uh, an area for the growth of those startup companies, and it's got the space cluster, so which consists, I think, of about a dozen of the companies. Uh, one of them has got the contract for the advanced microsatellite platform, which is going to be uh, used by Roscosmos, and I think the flight testing is going to start soon. Uh, the others are uh, involved uh, in uh, all, all the kinds of activities, uh, mostly covering avionics, flight software, or the new materials, and all that sort of things. Speaking of the <coughs> Of their involvement in the human spaceflight to the scale SpaceX is involved in the US. Um, I would say the guidelines, like the space program and the uh, principles of the space policy, we do not cover that scenario. Um, the, pr 
principles of these principles are saying that uh, the private industry should rather be involved in developing components and uh, providing services based, based on the results of the space activities. Uh, I would say that even technically, it is very hard to get the private company involved because even for the technical university, uh, in the history of 175 years, and uh, the customers being trained before they became customers, it was very difficult to obtain the license to build a microservice. Because uh, you should keep in mind, you should keep in mind that that activity uh, requires the license for us customers and uh, well, there are several types of licenses. There is a license to research, to build the prototypes, and to build the real flight hardware, and they are all different. So uh, I know some private companies, uh, I would say joint stock companies, which hold the license for production of the flight article. But uh, we are dealing with avionics, such as the remote sensing cameras. And uh, I would say that I can imagine in the near future uh, emergence of something like SpaceX. To my mind, SpaceX is a kind of unique phenomenon. It's, it's a coincidence of many factors in the same place, same time. Um, for the new generation of uh, spacecraft that Russia is developing, will they have the uh, ability to transport through past low Earth orbit? Yes. So that's that's why that's why two figures for the launch mass are given here. So 14 is for the low orbit, 20 is for say lunar missions. But uh, nothing precludes uh, it from being used for uh, safe missions to asteroids. If such an idea shows up and if it is approved. So essentially, um, as I told, uh, the same same reentry vehicle with the different heat shield probably for lunar missions will be used. Uh, and uh, the design of the uh, uh, propulsion compartment will be seriously different for the older uh, Hi, uh, I'm curious a bit about uh, the new philosophy towards uh, crew selection that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, where crews are now being required to all be recruited with engineering degrees and that work in, in that engineering field to raise their degrees. Um, I'm curious uh, what brought about that uh, perspective way of selecting crew uh, compared to historically when you look at and selecting, say, pilots, medical doctors, and so on. Uh, well, you see, pilots are still being selected. Um, so the engineering degrees <coughs> for um, the general public, I would say. Because uh, I think, I think. Actually, actually, I think uh, that the uh, pilot school, which is like a higher education facility, can give, it gives you a degree of to the degree of a specialist in engineering. Because we currently combine two systems. We combine the uh, old system, which was used in the Soviet Union, and uh, it is still used in Germany, for example, uh, the specialist education. So you graduate and uh, your degree is engineer with concentration here and there. And uh, there is the other way, uh, which is up to the long convention, bachelor, master, and PhD. So uh, for this kind of selection, bachelor is smart enough, so I guess uh, pilot school gives you the background. Uh, because speaking of that selection, uh, an Air Force pilot gets selected and got the training, gets a fully finished <coughs> test engineer customer. Um, 
With Rover's current uh, plans for the International Space Station, do you think their policies are going to change in the future about discontinuing uh, service in 2020? It's a sensitive question. Uh, it should be, should be discontinuing the services should be asked to cross uh, customs representatives. So I can't speak for that. But here is here is the point. It's just just like some information to think of. Uh, as you could see, uh, we get the written space program through two th uh, 2020. That program covers the use of the space station in, in the way it is used through 2020. Speaking of the period beyond, we don't, we don't have anything to rely on in our judgments because the new program has not yet been developed and even discussed. Um, if you want my personal judgment, um, it's got the engineering side as well, because uh, the station was originally designed for 15 years. Um, it's already more than 15 years for components like FGB. And um, it requires some serious engineering approach of extending the lifetime of the station. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I think if some, some of those decisions will be made, uh, it will be done on a yearly basis in the same way it was done in the Air Space Station. But as for the decisions, we will be continuing uh, our presence on ISS uh, after 2020 or not. I, I can't give you the answer. I want to thank uh, Victor very, very much for his uh, presentation on behalf of uh, all of you, the ISU uh, community here, uh, for being so frank with us and for explaining in some detail um, what is essentially a essential part of, uh, of space activities. Um, as we all know, we have uh, here, in, uh, we're here in Canada, we have a lot of uh, input from uh, North America, has some input from uh, the European um, program. Um, we will have some input on the Chinese program in the, in the next while. Um, but this is, this is a rare opportunity to have a very uh, in-depth and frank uh, conversation about uh, clearly this one of the most, uh, most important uh, and fundamental parts of uh, what we're trying to all look at uh, from an international um, perspective, which of course is the Russian space program. So, again, on behalf of everybody here, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Victor for such a, a great presentation. On behalf of the local organizing committee and the uh, two hosts at ES and HSC Montreal, um, please join uh, Victor in a, um, in a reception which will be outside to the right, so which will start immediately. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please keep in mind that you are called International Space University and based on my involvement with uh, international projects, I should say that it's, 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 a, it's a great thing which uh, actually enables us to be what we are now because if it wasn't for the international nations, there wouldn't have been Roscosmos or NASA or whatever else. Ser seriously, unless we would have joined our effort on ISS, the world would have been way different now in, in many respects. So keep in mind that you are part of the International Space University and uh, the international cooperation is very important.